Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's, it, excuse the month there. It's uh, been a busy morning in the lab, and uh, we've got a busy list this afternoon, so I'll be straight back there. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm just going to have a talk to, uh, to this topic just from purely from a clinician's uh, point of view. Um, so uh, I, I pulled this off uh, Wikipedia. It's uh, a development cycle research and uh, development. And uh, if we think about this amenable to us, we're all sort of familiar with this, uh, you know, coming up with a theory, and then exploring the hypothesis, then testing it out, clarifying what we want to study. Then we design and develop and test it, um, uh, phase one trial. Uh, then we implement it to see if it does anything, phase two trial. And then we study it uh, in a large scale setting, and that's uh, uh, phase three clinical trial. So uh, this sort of basic uh, concept is, is familiar to us. We come up with new ideas, which see new theories, and um, and the, the cycle begins again. Um, we we're surrounded by things that uh, are, are ripe for uh, development, obviously technology, uh, and especially in cardiology, there's a lot of uh, R&D that goes into the, the, the devices that we use. Uh, it, it can be new therapies, uh, for example, renal uh, sympathetic innovation is an uh, awful treatment uh, going on in cardiological circles at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, we're getting first and second generation devices being produced now, but it could also be uh, enhancing existing therapies such as uh, a coronary stent, for example. We're now up to third generation of drug eluting uh, coronary stents, but there's always uh, improvements that uh, they can be made. Um, pharmaceuticals, uh, of course, uh, but biotechnology, uh, peptides, use in the lab, chemicals, processes, that sort of thing. Um, information technology, um, uh, particularly for us in clinical circles, Patient management, system, uh, patient management systems and uh, decision support uh, systems. I think there's a lot of scope for that. There's been a lot of innovation in New Zealand in that regard. And um, you know, so it's not until you work overseas, you realize how good our information systems are. Being able to share, to share data nationally, being able to access data region-wide, you know, consumer is an amazing application when you see what most the hospitals have to deal with overseas, including in the States. Um, you just can't get half the information on patients that you can get out of, uh, out of concerto. Uh, we're very lucky to uh, have it. Um, if the other thing to uh, bear in mind uh, is also services. Be being New Zealand, you know, we've got the you know, we've got the work ethic and the culture where we say, well, you know, we just gotta find a way of doing it and making it work. And that makes us think of all sorts of different ways of doing things and new ways of doing things that many people overseas don't. So I'm sure there's many people and uh, many clinicians and, and, not, and, um, uh, uh, and other people in the health sector who have a lot of knowledge and skill that would actually be very, very useful um, uh, for, for a lot of people in the developing processes and uh, looking at things like patient throughput, um, patient management, all those sorts of things. Uh, practice reviews, uh, primary health care um, is uh, a, a, a really important one. Um, there's a lot of information sharing going now in the primary health sector. Um, and in many places overseas, primary health care is, is done in isolation uh, with very little sharing of data. Um, of course, this, all, this is all driven by clinical need. And it's up to us as clinicians to identify those areas of need. And, um, and it's raised right. If you don't stand back and think about the bigger picture, you're going to miss the, the areas and the opportunities um, uh, where um, things like this can be uh, brought to life. Um, we've got a pretty unique medical culture in New Zealand. Um, our healthcare is primarily publicly funded and that lends itself quite well to sharing of information and, and national coordination of resources. Um, we, we have unique, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the public ethic and our work ethic puts emphasis on, on value for money. So we don't have to make money in the public health sector, but we want to be sure that we're making the most of the money that we uh, that we get. And, and we figure out how to make things work. If it's not efficient enough, we figure out a way of making it more efficient or doing it differently uh, to try and meet that target. And New Zealanders have a, have a, uh, have a good work ethic. Um, you know, show us some work and we'll say, yeah, we'll do that. And we finish work when the work is finished. Um, many countries overseas don't have that same work ethic, including Australia. And that's why uh, New Zealand employees are very, very popular in Australia at the moment. Um, <laughs> we're fortunate in, um, in New Zealand that we don't have to worry about litigation. 
um, uh, because uh, you know the medical legal system and litigation is a big drag on health resources, particularly in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, ACC is the reason that we don't have litigation. You know, you, you can argue backwards and forwards about pros and cons of ACC, but from our perspective, as clinicians and health workers, um, uh, reduced exposure to litigation is a really important part of letting us get on with the job that we need to get on with. Um, and also, uh, you know, farming. Most countries overseas don't have a central drug agency that negotiates good prices on medication. We have farming. And um, compared to overseas, we have a far greater range of good evidence-based medications available to our patients. Um, uh, whereas in the States, what you are able to get depends entirely on what you can afford or what your insurance uh, plan covers. Um, you know, which is, is not right. For example, atorvastatin is a very common uh, um, uh, liver lowering medication that we use. Um, and and it's, in fact, it's the one with the most evidence uh, behind it. Um, but uh, many of, when I was in the States, many of the health insurers for the patients we were seeing didn't subsidize atorvastatin. They only subsidized simvastatin or pravastatin, which are two inferior, clinically inferior agents. So most of the patients could not afford to pay, the, uh, pay for the drug um, without insurance coverage. So they had to settle for inferior treatments. Um, whereas here, uh, Pharmac subsidizes a, a, a few statins only, and that the statins were the best evidence for uh, And you know, we should be uh, grateful for that. Uh, there are always things that, uh, that we want Pharmac to fund that they can't or don't, but uh, you know, I, I think the compromise is, is probably reasonable uh, for our size and for um, uh, the amount of you know, relatively small amount of money that we've got in health in New Zealand. Um, speaking of work ethic here, here's a, a very, um, here's a group in, uh, of nurses in the cath lab, they have very strong work ethic. In fact, they're up there getting patients ready for this afternoon's uh, uh, catheter list. Um, but, you know, we've got a great crew up there and uh, they, they, they do an awesome job and, you know, they just get on with the work and, and if there's a problem, they, they, they find something to fix it. A lot of ideas come from nurses and allied health staff as well. Um, you know, as doctors, we like to think we're the smartest people in the hospital. We're often not. Um, and, and we need to acknowledge that there are plenty of other people that can um, come up with ideas in this space. Um, so that, that's the way we think in New Zealand as clinicians. And, and, and we have uh, a, a bit of a stereotype about businessmen. Um, clinicians often aren't businessmen, or clinicians in New Zealand anyway. Uh, some are, and those ones you know, clearly thrive in the, in the private sector, but most aren't. And most clinicians are probably a little bit distrustful of business. Um, we care about our patients, that's our number one focus. Businesses care about money, that's businesses' number one focus. Um, and also, uh, at, at least in the medical uh, space, there's been a lot of uh, uh, stuff in the recent years that, uh, that has shown how business adversely influences clinical decision making. Uh, for example, uh, St. Jude's uh, manufacturing problems with uh, ICD leads has uh, is, um, been a problem, uh, particularly in the States where ICDs are implanted very, very frequently. Uh, Mark Madey was a cardiologist in Baltimore who implanted 30 stents from one, one particular company in one day, uh, and they uh, shouted him a pig roast uh, at his place. Uh, he was also on the payroll, and uh, he was audited and found uh, that he'd been implanting um, stents inappropriately and also receiving kickbacks from business. And he was struck off the uh, register uh, in, in Baltimore. He's no longer working as an individual cardiologist. And uh, a, a drug here called Dronadarone, or, or Maltac, um, which has been the subject of very intense uh, debate in the medical literature. Um, and it's of dubious benefit when you, in treating atrial fibrillation, when you uh, analyze the data. Uh, but this drug has had a lot of money invested in it and it's been marketed very, very aggressively uh, and it's prescribed uh, commonly in the States but basically nowhere else. Um, and one of the reasons it's pre prescribed in the States is because of the marketing effort that's uh, put behind it. So all of these things were, you know, make us a little bit skeptical about business involvement in, uh, in healthcare. Um, but can we get along? Uh, you know, as clinicians, uh, and I use the broad term, including everyone in the hospital, you know, we can't get our expensive ideas to fruition without business involvement. Likewise, businesses can't make money without our ideas. 
So we have to find a way of, of, of getting along. And I just put down some principles here, and I think there needs to be trust between clinicians and, and business. There needs to be transparency between uh, you know dealing with um, uh, business and dealing with clinicians as well. And, and really, clinicians are out there after a fair go. You know, we, we work hard. We come up with these ideas, and, and you know, we just want, we just want a fair go, and uh, we don't want um, you know to be all, all to be pulled over our eyes. In, in medicine, ownership of intellectual property is a big issue as, as well. And uh, one of the advantages of involvement with the, the help out that I see is that uh, clinicians will be able to retain uh, ownership of the IP. That's really important. Um, so uh, today we've got um, in, uh, Andrew and Richard from Hotspot. So uh, these are the guys that I've been uh, working with in the, in the last few years. So Hotspot was, was, was a startup company uh, actually uh, started by Nigel Sherrick, who's an interventionist. Who last time was working in state in Europe, then, is that right? Yeah, I still say yeah. um, and uh, he invented this device to um, uh, measure uh, uh, arterial stiffness, arterial resistance. Um, and this device has been slowly developed um, uh, by Andrew and the others from Oscar. Andrew's the, the chief technical officer um, into a more mature product. And what you see here is the Cardioscope 2, uh, which is the final, uh, well, not, yeah, which is the latest iteration of a series of these. Uh, devices uh, that uh, we've been using to look into vascular stiffness and now uh, pulse waveform analysis. So the uh, the, the cardioscope 2 monitor here, uh, you put it around your arm, it, it goes up and down like a blood pressure cuff and it gives you a trace of your central aortic waveform without a, um, without a catheter being put in there. Um, uh, so uh, we've, uh, we've, we've done some work in the um, uh, cath lab at Auckland Hospital. Um, uh, come down and have a look at this device after you can get your arterial stiffness measured and printed down. And take away with it. Um, you know, come and have a look at it, it's great. Um, uh, so your blood pressure cuff goes around the arm and basically the device measures some fancy uh, or, or measures the reflection of, of pulse waveforms from the central uh, vasculature uh, towards the cuff and, and the reflections back and forth off the cuff and it through some fancy mathematics of reconstruct your, uh, your, your central waveform. Um, uh, so here's the cardioscope 2 and the latest version is the, the, the cardioscope 3 which is available uh, commercially. Um, there's uh, software as well which is used to uh, analyze the waveforms and do various things with the figures that the device uh, spits out. And um, part of getting a, uh, you know, getting a bit of, um, uh, or part of validating the device is getting evidence that it, that it works. Evidence for us means publications and uh, uh, we've had, um, just recently had, um, uh, had the data from the latest version of the uh, postal published in uh, Journal of Hypertension. So that hopefully gives uh, a lot more credibility and then we'll lead on to bigger and uh, better things. Um, and uh, the last uh, couple of words, um, uh, so I was fortunate enough, I did my uh, uh, individual fellowship in uh, Michigan, in the United States, in uh, Detroit, which is in southeast Michigan, and there's downtown Detroit, and uh, uh, Royal Oak Hospital is about half an hour from downtown, and the drive along Woodward Ave, uh, which incidentally at the start of Woodward Ave, there was the first traffic light in the world uh, in the 1920s, I think it was, and when they first put up, no one knew what to do, so it didn't change anything. <laughs> Crashing into one of them, um, uh, but um, uh, you know, downtown Detroit is really dilapidated now. It's a, it's, it's a hellhole. Um, uh, everyone's taken if you can afford it's taken flight into the suburbs, which are relatively safe. And so it's really a shame to see. Look, there's a, there used to be a lot of money in Detroit. Um, it's a lot of old architecture, um, great museums and things. It's really a shame to see that go downhill. Um, but uh, fortunately, Royal Oak was in a, uh, in a safe part of town. Uh, this is William Beaumont Hospital, one of, one of the hospitals which has uh, just under 1,100 beds. Um, and the intensive care unit is 10 stories. Every specialty has, a, um, has its own intensive care unit for, uh, including cardiology and the coronary care for. Um, and I was fortunate, fortunate to work with a, uh, you know, a great, great team of nurses and lab. Actually, uh, Simon Nixon here, who was the director of the camp lab, is now the director of cardiovascular services. Is Nick Takiwi, the trained green lab. He's from the, from uh, Dunedin. Um, so, you know, Kiwi's succeeding overseas. Um, the big difference, the America, the reason you go to America is because it's different from here. And uh, it's different in culture, different health culture, and different approach to the health system. Health here is a business. And, and in order to survive, the health providers have to make money. And, and so uh, there's, there's a lot more thought that goes in towards innovating and, dis and differentiating yourself 
uh, from your competitors, and some of it seems a bit cheesy actually. The marketing campaign that comes to you have a bone on top. I live now very open in the hospital, of course my doctor is going to be my own doctor, but uh, um, you know, uh, there are websites from all of the hospitals which have timers on, which tell you how long you're going to wait in the emergency department to see a, um, to see a doctor. Um, and so people look up on the website and they say, well I only have to wait uh, nine minutes to see a doctor at DMC Surgery, so I'm going to go there and give my health insurance dollars to them. So it's all these sorts of things you know, aimed at uh, you know, trying to optimise their business. Um, the um, Beaumont um, Hospital um, spawned off its own commercialization unit, um, which was just starting up. I actually met up with people uh, there. They, they had a couple of uh, products in their portfolio, but they were a fairly new unit. Um, and you didn't get confidence they had a lot of business now uh, behind them, but you know, maybe it was just um, sort of new. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're very keen to protect their own intellectual property. And when you sign up with Beaumont, if you come up with any ideas, part of your contract is that you sign the intellectual property over to them as well. Um, you know, and uh, you know, that's what makes you sort of worry that a lot of doctors who come up with ideas will keep their ideas to themselves until they've left the system and then develop them themselves. Uh, develop them themselves. Physician salaries in uh, the US are uh, far higher than they are here, so physicians can afford to develop products themselves and develop at least the patents and uh, get the IP protected before they uh, look at selling it on. Uh, but here, um, you know, most physicians probably aren't in a position to, to be able to do that. So, you know, it was, it was a sort of eye-opening uh, experience for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it from me. And I'll uh, actually come down and have a look at the, uh, the Bosch Ball uh, monitor here. Yeah, thanks.